Please welcome Stephen Weiss. I want to tell you a little about Stephen. Stephen teaches in our business division sometimes, and sometimes out at our Garfield campus. Um, and Stephen writes about himself that he was fascinated with computers ever since the age of 10 when his computer got him a Commodore 64. Yeah. And I've got you beat, Steve, because I'm a little older. My dad got me a Commodore Big 20. Oh, 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 oh. Yes. 5K RAM. Yes. 5K. Wow. I'm a super. <laughs> uh, Stephen studied computer science at George Mason University and got his master's in computer information technology at Regis University in uh, Denver. In his teaching career, he's taught many subjects from intro to computers all the way to network security and systems engineering. Uh, and he has delivered courses at Glendale Community College uh, and is currently teaching at the New York Film Academy in Los Angeles. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, Steve is also a published author, screenwriter, actor, musician, and so forth as a geek. So of course he's welcome here. I give you Stephen Weiss. Thank you all. I want to ask quickly, I'm kind of curious, how many of you here are faculty at this uh, school? OK. I kind of guessed that. Cool. Uh, I, I wish I had met more of you. Um, you know, I, I've only been part time and uh, mostly at Garfield when I've been around. So uh, I haven't met a lot of you. But I'm glad you're here. Thank you for coming. Uh, and this is uh, you know, kind of a first time for me. Uh, I, Mike. Uh, let me know about this uh, science lecture series through an email and I said this sounds like a really great thing I want to be a part of it and one of my favorite subjects in the field of computer science is artificial intelligence and as he mentioned ever since I was about 10 years old I have been using computers but there's something about computers and humanity that is very compelling to me and I think to a lot of people where we think about can a computer relate to a human being? And, and on what level? And how? And can we do this? And will it happen before I die? I think these are questions that a lot of us think about when we think about artificial intelligence. So when we talk about it, what is artificial intelligence, right? It, basically, it's a computer or a machine simulating a human's thoughts uh, and actions, okay, being able to do things intelligently like a, a human being, which is funny because human beings often do things unintelligently. <laughs> <laughs> we can program them to do that too, of course. But uh, it's something where we want computers to be able to do things for us. Now, of course, computers are really good at solving certain things, doing certain things, and there's also certain things that we as human beings have to do that we hate. So why not have a machine do it? Like Rosie here, okay? <laughs> Rosie, the, the maid on the Jetsons. Okay. Uh, obviously did the cleaning, cooking, and things like that. A, a lot of things that uh, people don't like to do, at least I don't. I'm not, I mean, maybe cooking every once in a while or something. But you know, I don't like dusting and cleaning. And all. Boy, wouldn't it be great if we had a robot that would do that? And, and one that, that we didn't have to really explain too much to. You know, kind of just like if you hired a real maid, right? Well, just get the windows, but you know, no streaking, and make sure you get the dust, but leave the dishes alone. I'm going to do that later, or, or my kids need to do that so they learn that as part of their chores. Whatever, right? Just give them simple and let them go. And you're not worried that, oh, say, the robot might break all your windows, throw stuff out of them or something, right? So you get to the point where the robot is smart enough that you can trust it to, to perform these type of tasks. And I have to tell you, there's, there's so much about this subject uh, that I love and that I want to talk about. I'm, I'm going to talk a lot, but I want, I'm even going to try to leave some time for questions at the end, you know, maybe about 10 minutes but there's so much to this field, and it's so fascinating and so amazing. And I am kind of coming from the point of view uh, of, say, you, you, my audience knowing computers in general, but not so much artificial intelligence. So this is, in a way, an introduction to artificial intelligence. But we will get into some of the more uh, interesting technologies that are involved with it. Okay? So don't fall asleep early on, because it will get interesting. I promise. And if you guys fall asleep as faculty, I'm just going to. You know what that's like. All right, so computers 
uh, to be able to function like a human being, they have to be able to sense like us. So, and, and we have you know the, the traditional five senses, but we don't really need computers to be able to taste things, right? So you know, not so much. Am I scary there for a second? But uh, you know, so we're not too worried about that. And and maybe not smelling unless they're doing something like detecting a gas leak, which would be awesome. But in general, most of the things that we do don't so much involve the tasting and smelling stuff. But sight, seeing things, right? Hearing things, sound and touching things, right? Well, if we want the robot to actually do anything, pick anything up, uh, you know, move something, then it has to be able to touch. But also, it, it needs to be able to feel something that it's touching, because you don't want, you know, robot or whatever picking up your basket of eggs and there you go, right? So it's important that there's some kind of feedback, some input by, from the touch to whatever machine or robot that is. Now, of course, depending on what task we want the robot to do, okay, or machine or whatever this is with the artificial intelligence, it may need to talk, okay, or it may need to do something, or maybe to display some information, okay, and it could display it as text or a picture or anything like that, but it's got to have some output, right, some way to talk to us. So if we make it, like a human being, which is one option, which is something we're kind of used to, then we do want it to talk, right? Because that's our primary way of communicating, which is interesting, and it brings up a whole other field, which I could do an entire talk on, of, of psychology and verbal communication as opposed to visual, right? And then, you know, you've heard the, the saying that over 80% of communication is visual, right? You know, how you look and move and, and all that stuff. And of course, that's a whole other <laughs> subject of computers being able to recognize that. And honestly, they're not so good at that yet. They're mostly good at recognizing voice and putting them into words and then figuring out what you mean. So don't, don't try to have a robot girlfriend just now. Probably won't work out too well or boyfriend. But we will get to that, interestingly enough. <laughs> all right, now this is the thing. And this always happens to me when I do, when I think about artificial intelligence. I am amazed. You know, last night I, I was having dinner with a friend of mine. And he's, he's an older gentleman and not really into computers very much. And I told him I was giving this lecture today. And while we were having dinner, he had a glass of wine. And he was listening. Oh, yeah, uh-huh. Took a drink of the glass of wine, put it back down. And didn't even really look that much at the glass or think about it. But he drank some wine. And I said... Here's an example. What you did just now was amazing. And he's like, what? What did I do? <laughs> I said, you drank, you drank wine, and you did that while you were talking to me, kind of in between, and without really even paying attention. And I said, do you, do you know how hard it is for a robot to be able to do something like that? And he's like, no, not really. I said, well, your, wine, your glass, it's, it's, you know, the wine glass is made of fragile material. So a robot would have to first identify where it is in 3D space which we do automatically. And then it would have to extend its arm in the 3D space and grab the glass. It would have to probably know that the best place to grab the glass is by the stem, right? Instead of maybe the more fragile bowl part of the glass. Grab it and it would have to pick it up with enough force so it didn't drop it, but not too much that it wouldn't smash it. Okay, so then you'd have to do that, and then you have to get this trajectory right up to your mouth without spilling any of the liquid, tilt it just enough so you get a mouthful, and then put it back down and place it, 3D you know, perspective, on the table, and then let it go. And we don't even have to think about that, but do you know how hard it is to get a robot to do that? That is hard. So getting a robot just to even perceive the world like we do is very difficult. Hey, and there's, uh, you know, that's just one thing. Driving a car. We do so many things at the same time when we drive a car. Okay, we are doing object recognition. We're doing 3D perception. We're listening to sounds. Okay, we're keeping track of our position and the position of countless other moving objects around us. Okay, we're looking for signs. We're reading. Okay, we're looking behind us to the sides of us. And we're doing all this simultaneously. But, and this wouldn't be so hard for a computer, maybe, if there weren't unpredictable situations. Oh no, the truck in front of me, boxes started falling off of it. 
Okay? Well, you know, you can't program a rule for every single possibility that could happen in the real world. And that is one of the keys to artificial intelligence. Okay? Artificial intelligence is thinking and coming up with answers to a question that we couldn't predict or that we simply don't have an exhaustive library of every single possibility. I mean, theoretically, if we had infinite space and infinite you know, programming, we could program every single possibility that a, a driver would face into it. Right? That would not be fun, first of all. But it would also be quite a long list to look through as boxes were falling on, toward you on the highway. <laughs> right? Oh, let me see if this is in the list. And computers are fast, but if there's billions of possibilities of what's happening, right, that's not really an optimal solution. So at this point, a computer is going to have to generalize. It's going to have to be like, OK, I don't care if that's a box of Tide. <laughs> right? It doesn't matter if this has Tide on it or, or wine or, or you know, um, Brazilian mongo lizards. It doesn't matter what the label is on the box. So it needs to ignore that information. It needs to think, OK, dangerous object coming toward me. And that's all. Right? So it's got to prioritize. It's got to categorize. It's got to generalize and say, it doesn't matter what kind of box this is. I don't have to specifically identify the box. I just have to get out of the way. Okay? And that's something that is starting to get into computers having intelligence, where they're able to make decisions, where they're able to think in a way. Right? We're not really thinking, because we don't even know what we're doing when we're thinking, honestly. I mean, we, we understand biology to an extent and neurons and all that stuff. We don't really know what's all going on inside our brain. So how are we going to put that on a computer? But we approximate thinking by giving it some intelligence, giving it a way to decide what to do, given the information that it knows, which is what we do all the time. We may not have had that specific thing happen to us, but we know enough that if an object is coming toward us, okay, and even then, how do we know an object's coming toward us? Generally, it's getting larger in our field of vision. Right? We don't think about that. Hmm, that box is getting larger in my field of vision right now. No, we don't think that. We just, ah, get out of the way. Fast. We do so many things instantly. Driving a car, painting a picture. How, how can you explain that to somebody? How do you paint a picture? Especially artistically. Sure, you could do it maybe exactly like a photograph, but that's not most of what art is, right? Art is putting some kind of feeling into it, some kind of abstractness that we do, okay? And like I said, dealing with unpredictable circumstances, answering a question, because again, we can't tell a computer every single question and every single answer to every single question. Because if we knew that, we'd probably be God anyway. We wouldn't need a computer to do that. But it has to be able to think. So being able to think means it can make inferences and use logic. It can say, well, like with the driving, I don't know what that object is, but I know that I don't want the car to hit it. Okay. I don't know what that bird is, but it kind of looks like a chicken. So let me look up my knowledge base and see what birds are similar to chickens. Something like that, right? Oh, this is a turkey. Okay, you know, things like that. Something like we might do. See something we don't know, we go look it up. Right? And so these modern computers can have access to larger knowledge bases like the internet, which may or may not be completely accurate, by the way. If you didn't know that, okay, not everything on the internet is true. Thought I'd point that out, yeah. But there are vast knowledge bases on the internet and through networks that we're able to access that these you know, artificial intelligences can use just like we do. But of course, if they're all computerized and digitized, then they can use them a lot faster than us and figure stuff out that it's never, quote unquote, thought about before. All right, so we have different types of artificial intelligence and um, use them at different times for different things. But just, just that first thing, object recognition, has been challenging artificial intelligence scientists for years. Okay? Because we humans work in such a general way. We don't need two specific information pieces for us to be able to identify things. You know, uh, what's a cup? Well, a cup can have so many shapes and forms, but immediately we can look at a cup. That's ah, a cup, right? We don't have to think about it. Or that's a fork. Forks can have three tines or four tines and different funky shapes and be made of plastic or metal and all that stuff. But we don't have to think about it. Hmm, what is that? <laughs> all right, we just know. We just instantly recognize things. But 
a computer, we have to start it out. It's, it's, it's worse than a baby, okay? Because even a baby, human, has built-in instinct to recognize like mom and dad and to recognize objects and, and smell food and things like a computer doesn't even have any of that. So it's got to start from nothing. So it's just getting, imagine if you were blind and all of a sudden you can see, okay? Now you have to make sense of all this stuff coming in. Like, oh my gosh, people, you know, they're looking at, I mean, it's just it's pretty crazy and freaky. And you have to identify objects and all of a sudden you have 3D perception you've never had before. So that's what it's kind of like to a computer, except it doesn't even have the, the basic knowledge you do of, of objects. So we have to teach it everything. All right. Um, so what I wanted to do, and actually, is talk about, in sound and voice recognition, we're getting really good with identifying words, okay, and um, computers being able to parse language. Okay? And if you're in the computer science field, parsing is kind of a, a technical term where you, you take a series, a sentence, or a, a, a command, or instructions, and break it down into different pieces and see what they are. You know, if you parse a sentence in English, you kind of go, you know, subject, verb, object, noun, all these different things, article, break it down, and then parse it for the meaning. What does this mean? Okay. So if you're parsing a command, what am I supposed to do now? Okay, and that's what our, our computers are doing with that. Now, of course, that comes into our problem solving. So recognizing the voice and identifying the words is great, but then once you know what the words are, they have to mean something. Okay. You could recognize words all day. Uh, you know, when I was, uh, and, and uh, this is going to sound silly, but when I was two, uh, I, uh, my, my parents had done me this phonics thing, and it works, by the way. Uh, and uh, my dad would have me read the newspaper. I know it might sound, what, you're two, two, read the newspaper? I would. He would sit me on his lap, and I would read the words, because I could pronounce them phonetically, because I'd done the phonics. I didn't know what the words really were, but I could say them, Okay. But what I was lacking was the meaning of that, right? So I needed to get to the next part to solve the, the language problem and figure out what it is. Well, all right. We need all three of these things together to have, say, a human-like robot or even a simple task-based robot that's going to interact in the physical world. It's got to be able to identify objects, hear and recognize words, and figure out what they mean. That's already a big challenge, right? So then it can't do tasks. It can't complete any of these tasks until it can already do all this other stuff. Stuff that we take for granted. Okay, so as human beings, we really are amazing. I can't stress it enough. You know, it's so crazy, the stuff that we do. And looking at AI you know, makes you realize it a lot more. Now, I have my friend Aaron today uh, bring uh, his artificial intelligence with him. Okay, it's the new iPhone, so the 4GS, 4S. And it has an artificial intelligence companion on it named Siri. How many of you heard of Siri? All right, so we're going to test it out right now. So if you don't mind. All right, so what you do with Siri is you talk to it and you give it commands. Now, Aaron has assured me that it doesn't have to know my voice. He didn't even have to train it for my voice. That it'll be able to, know, to recognize my words even though I've never talked to it before. Right, so I can talk to Siri. I just hold this down, right, and then talk, okay. Siri, how are you doing today? Think about it. I am well. All right. <laughs> so we have simple artificial, and I, and I haven't played with this before, really, except we asked it a few crazy things over the apartment, like, will you marry me and stuff, which was fun. Uh, <laughs> But I'm gonna, I want to test Siri out a little bit here. I'm going to ask it a couple of things. Okay. Siri, I want you to know that my hair is blue. Sir, I don't understand. Ah. Siri, I want you to know that my hair is blue. So I was trying to teach it something that was kind of irrelevant. <laughs> okay. Now, Siri is task-based. It's supposed to help me do certain things. So apparently that's not, kind of not in its... Uh, field to just know random things that make no sense. Okay. Now, do you think I could teach it that to say it, to remember that somehow? Uh, you can tell it to remember that certain people are relatives. Okay. So say, you know, so and so is my mother, so and so is my brother. Okay. Um, can tell it to change your name. You know, call you. 
Obviously, I've got calling me sir. Right, it does say, yeah, have sir after that. Um, so it, it's programmed to do certain things, but it is a task-based thing. It's not supposed to necessarily simulate a human perfectly, but you can have it do a lot of things. Now, let me think. I, it, it is really helpful, though, because it will parse a lot of commands that uh, are things that you would normally have your phone do or your technology do, right? Um, so let me do this. Siri, send Stephen Weiss a text saying, I hate you. Oh, it, it, Here's it, it. your message to Stephen Weiss. <laughs> so, Do I have to send it? Do I have to send it? Yes. Okay, I'll send your message. All right, so I... <laughs> I didn't really have to do anything except tell it uh, that I want to send a text to a contact, contact in my list and uh, that what I want it to say. So eventually, I'll get a text message here on my regular phone. My dumb phone, I like to call it. Stellasaurus. Not a smartphone. <laughs> so, um, and you can ask it all kinds of useful things. Um, let's see. Weather in Chicago. Right, uh, I was trying to think of what, what movie just came out. What movie just came out? Paranormal What's that? Paranormal Activity. Oh, Paranormal Activity. Siri, I want to watch Paranormal Activity 3. OK, here's your meeting. Note that you already have an all-day meeting about Deb Lehman's birthday. OK, so apparently, <laughs> if I want to watch this movie, it's on the same day as he already has an appointment. <laughs> no, we'll cancel that. I can just cancel over that. See, I didn't hold it long enough. Oh, okay. Cancel. Yeah, see, I haven't meeting is already scheduled for 3 p.m. Oh, yeah, well, now it's already scheduled. Apparently, I'm watching Paranormal Activity at 3. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right, and you, know, you can have some fun with it. Uh, you know, like, Siri, do you love me? How can I tell? Yeah, right, so. <laughs> I mean, it tries. So, and, and you can ask it other things, too, like, um, I don't know. How far is it to Chicago from Los Angeles? Sorry, sir. I can only get directions starting from your current location. All right, but it understood what I meant. So I can say, I'll try it. Siri, how far is Chicago from here? Here are directions to Chicago. All right, so <laughs> you guys ready? Let's go. All right, so it's going to pull up the, the maps and everything and, uh, and, and tell me how to go. To, ooh, that's kind of far. 2,010 miles. Yeah, even driving straight, that's uh, over a day. So let's see. So if I just hold this down, I'll go back to Syria yeah. again. Yeah. All right. Can I ask math questions? I was going to ask it a math question later because I wanted to know something, actually. Let, let me ask it this. Let's see if I can get back to Siri, can you do advanced math? Sir, I don't understand. Okay, at least it's honest. Siri, can you do advanced math? <laughs> uh, all right, I want to take some questions you guys have. So uh, raise your hand now, and if you've got any questions for Siri. How old is the Earth? How old is the Earth? All right. Oh, boy, this should be good. <laughs> yeah, I went back to that. Siri, how old is the Earth? I found this for you. All right, so it's linking me to the internet. Uh, age of the Earth result: four point five four billion years. Uh, unit conversion. Oh, uh, by the way, it's one point four three times ten to the seventeen seconds. <laughs> In case you wanted to know that. Point uh, four five the expected lifetime of the sun. Okay, so. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there's a, there's a database called Wolfram Alpha that, Alpha that it uses a lot to get this kind of information for you. So if it understands that you want some kind of information looked up, it'll often just link you or pop it right up there on the screen. Any other question? It's 22 divided by 7. You want pi almost. Siri, what is 22 divided by 7? Check that for you. I found this for you. Okay, it's 
Apparently, it's got an entry for it because it's approximating pi. So, you know, you can't see it. But, you know, I have 3.14 du 8571 du Yeah. So, anyway, it's a, you know, approximation of pi, you nerd. Okay, yes? Where is the biggest Muslim population? Okay. Siri, where is the largest Muslim population in the world? <laughs> How smart are you, Siri? Let me check on that. Okay. How about a web search for Siri? Where is the largest Muslim population in the world? So it's a question, so it's going to, you know, let me go ahead and search the web for it. Searching for Siri, where is the largest Unfortunately, Muslim it's asking, it's including in Siri in the search, but, you know. <laughs> it's not perfect, but it's pulling up a web and list of countries by Muslim population. Okay, like first link. So that's pretty helpful, I would think. Yep. And they have a, a map of the Muslim world with the top 10 largest populations. And uh, wow. Yeah, so that's really useful. All right. So, um, oh, by the way, I want to get ask Siri this for later. So what's the answer? Uh, I, I have to click on the link. Uh, let's see. Pakistan, India. Oh, sorry. Now it thinks I'm talking to it. That's another problem with voice recognition. <laughs> Is it doesn't well? I haven't said maybe because I haven't said its name yet. It's just listening to me. It hasn't. You don't need to say its name. Oh, I'm, it, it just probably doesn't know what the heck I'm. I'm, ta I'm just talking. La la la. Hi Siri. All right. Um, what was I going to ask it? Oh, Siri. What is twelve factorial? Let's see if it gets that. I have to hit the button again. Oh no. Look, just ignored all that other stuff. That's pretty cool. What kind of restaurant are you looking for? Whoa, okay. <laughs> uh, it was relating that to my last question, actually. It was trying to be smart, and it's uh, sending me to a Pakistani or Indian. Oh, because of what else I was saying. It took that whole thing I said and tried to understand it. So, you know, and I mentioned Pakistan and India. So it's, it's asking me if I want a Pakistani or Indian restaurant. <laughs> so, all right, but I'll, I'll ask it something, maybe something else later. So that was, that was kind of fun. But um, so what it's doing here is my, th these middle two things, right? Sound and voice recognition, problem solving. And then in a sense, in a way, it's doing task completion, at least informational-wise. Yeah. Let's see if I got my text message. Oh, it didn't get there yet. Oh, I don't have signal. <laughs> OK, that would be why. So yeah, limits of technology. All right, so you know, in a limited way, it's doing it. But it is really helpful. Uh, you know, Aaron was mentioning to me that he, while he was driving, he didn't want to be trying to text, so he would just tell Siri to text for him. Right? Hey, Siri, text so-and-so this, and tell him I'm going to be late, or I'm bringing this, or whatever. And right, this is kind of something I was mentioning earlier in terms of object recognition. Okay? What is a chair? So um, we know pretty much instinctively what a chair is. And even if we tried to explain it to somebody, it would be kind of a weird conversation, wouldn't it? It's a chair. Well, it has four legs. No, wait. It doesn't have four legs always. Uh, it's, you sit on it. OK. But it's not a couch. Uh, you know, so what is it? We just know what a chair is. You know? But uh, imagine looking at all these different things as a computer and saying, OK, here, computer, this is a chair. That's a chair, too. That's a computer probably think you're nuts, right? <laughs> That's, how is this and that and that all the same thing? They're completely different. They're made of different stuff. One of these chairs is made out of CDs, for goodness sake. How do we know what, what a chair is? But that's the kind of challenges uh, that are presented in uh, artificial intelligence. Okay. Now, I have some clips I wanted to show you. Behind the walls of Japan's top university could lie the answer to many a household dream. Meet the world's first made robots. It's called AR, or assistant robot. Everyday tasks like picking up a breakfast tray and depositing it in the sink go smoothly for AR because of the technique which enables it to recognize and locate three-dimensional objects. And take laundry. The robot maid can find a dirty shirt, throw it into the washing machine, and press those all-important rinse and spin buttons. Just washing one they shirt. They are the of Jersey University's Information and Robot Technology Research Center, along with several of Japan's blue chip companies. This was This is the first launch. Of All the right, robot. so let's leave that running there for a second. Uh, so this robot has to identify objects visually using using cameras, okay, and then it has to pick them up without crushing them violently. Right? And, uh, you know, and it recognizes a chair, for instance, right, right there. 
Uh, it's, it, what's happening here is it missed a spot on the floor, and it recognizes that. There's a little spot that it missed when it was cleaning the floor. So um, that is using uh, in its intelligence, right? And it goes over there, and it knows how to use uh, the uh, laundry equipment, right? And of course, like each washer and dryer will be different. The buttons will be in different places, all that kind of stuff. So uh, it may involve some training of the robot in those cases to be able to use it, you know? Just like some people who need to be trained to use their you know, DVD player or VCR, right? Ah, oh, get the kids to show me how to do this. So, you know, same kind of thing. Uh, show the uh, robot how to do it. Okay, so uh, let's see. Now, we do have another type of artificial intelligence that is out there. Expert systems. It's kind of funny. I mentioned how humans are really good at doing general stuff, uh, you know, broadly recognizing things, doing a whole bunch of different things. But really specific things, computers are better than we are, in most cases anyway. Okay? So even though we, it's really hard to make a computer function like one of us, we can have a computer function as a problem solver for a specific type of thing. And it can do it very, very well. Okay? Things like playing chess. Okay, if you remember, Deep Blue in 1997 defeated Gary Kasparov, world chess champion. And believe me, Gary was not happy about that. Okay, he, he even got angry and accused the computer of cheating at some point. Not sure how, that, how it could have cheated. But uh, it's, it, it's really good at chess, right? You ask it to make you an omelet, pff, nothing. But it can play chess really well, okay? That's it. So it's an expert system. Uh, diagnosing sickness. There's been instances where, uh, because of a computer's vast access to knowledge, okay, it can often make medical diagnosis, and I hate to say it, better than a real doctor. Okay? Because often there may be symptoms or things of some rare disease or something that a doctor is not familiar with, okay? but the expert system has access to pretty much all the medical data you know, that we can give it. So, and it can not necessarily remember all of it, but to have access to it. Um, and so it can do things that are very specific really well. And so, recently, uh, we had a good example of this from IBM. You hear about them making a robot to play Angry Birds? <laughs> so IBM decided to make a computer Our first round to play Jeopardy. These categories, literary character APB. All points bulletin. Beatles, this computer is Watson. Olympic oddities. Designed specifically to play decade, Jeopardy. Final Frontier. But to play Jeopardy. And alternate meanings. You have to understand English. Let's take alternate meanings for 200 hours. Four letter word for a vantage point or a belief. Right. What is it? Beauty? Right here, uh, we see Watson point. thinking. Four letter word for the iron fitting on the hoof of a horse or a card dealing box in a casino. Watson, what is it? You are right. You get to pick. Literary character, APB, for 800. Answer, the Daily Double. Now it has to know what a Daily Double is and figure it out. Watson, although you have the $400, you know, of course, that you can risk up to the maximum value of you on the board, and that is 1,000. 1,000, please. All right, here is the Daily Double. Go for see. Wanted for killing Sir Danvers Carew. Appearance, pale and dwarfish. Seems to have a split personality. He thinks. Who is I? I, yes, Dr. Beatles Beatles for 200. And anytime you feel the pain, hey, Beatles this lyrics. guy, refrain. Don't carry the world upon your shoulders. Watson. Who is Jude? Yes. Olympic oddities for 200. Milorad Kavic almost upset this man's perfect 2008 Olympics, losing to him by one hundredth of a second. Watson, who is Michael Phelps? Yes. All right, so what's happening is this computer is thinking and analyzing large, vast amounts of data, uh, right? And uh, now it's, it's interesting because humans can do the same thing. We hold so much stuff in our head, it's ridiculous but uh, we can't really quantify it. However, Watson, you can pretty much know what it knows by what data you gave it. Oh, here's my text message uh, <laughs> from Aaron. So, uh, but it's, it, what is fun about this is it's showing you its thinking process you know, while it's doing, playing the game. 
Now, what we would think, you know, in our mind, we'd probably be a lot more scattered because we're not a, necessarily a computer. We'd be like, oh, yeah, that was uh, that guy and, uh, you know, the painting. Uh, oh, Last Judgment, you know, whatever. But it thinks differently than us because it's not a human. But we get to kind of peek into its process. What it's doing is determining probability of the right answer. And so you can see that probability right there, 90% that it's Lady Madonna. It does the same thing in a way that we do. Okay, if you were playing Jeopardy, and you thought you were right, it would depend on how sure you were of whether you were right, whether you buzzed in and answered the question. And so it's got like a limit. Basically, it's been programmed with how far, how much do I have to, to be sure before I answer the question, okay? See, it's not gonna buzz in there. It wasn't sure enough to answer the question. And it may, uh, I didn't program it, so I don't know, but it may actually also use uh, the amount that the, you know, the current question is worth. If it's worth more, it may decide that it has to be more sure of the answer before it's gonna buzz in. Okay, so things like that. But it's, it's using a vast knowledge base, but somehow it's connecting, right? And that answer was Voldemort, actually, which was the second one in its list, but it was only about 10%. So <clears throat> if you think about it, 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 it relates to humans in one way and it doesn't. It thinks differently, but these same kind of things happen to us. Sometimes we, have, we think the wrong answer is right. Sometimes we're not sure, okay? And so the same thing really is happening. Like, that's wrong right there. It was uh, something else. It was terminus instead of finis, but it was sure, 98%, that it was finis. Wrong, okay? Happens to us too. I was sure that was the right answer, right? So artificial intelligence is not perfect because, well, it's made by us in the first place. Uh, but um, also, it is limited, okay? All right, so good old Watson here cleaned the clock of both humans. By the way, Ken and Brad, the best uh, top winners in Jeopardy ever, okay? Played against Watson and were thoroughly defeated. Uh, <laughs> so, there you go. I think, I, think one, I think Ken won one of the days, but, or one of the rounds or something, but besides that, uh, Watson just, you know, so, but it's, that's because of expert systems. It's really good at playing Jeopardy. Again, it's not going to drive a car or make you an omelet, okay, but it's going to play Jeopardy like nothing else, right? That's the way it's designed. Now, if we could get a computer to do a whole bunch of these things all at the same time, that would more approximate a human being. Uh, computers use a heuristic, okay, which is what we really do too. Uh, to problem solve. Basically, what a heuristic method does, and you hear this term a lot in artificial intelligence, it's a way to solve a problem to get a satisfactory solution. In, in real life, and often in math and other things, there are so many solutions, millions possibly of solutions, that we don't have time to examine every single one. So how do we pick one? How do we pick one that's going to be good enough? Okay? And that's what we do every single day when we do things. Okay? When we drive, when we stay within the lane, that's good enough in most cases. Okay? We don't have to stay exactly 0.3 meters or whatever from the, the, the edge of the line or something like that. Okay? Satisfactory. So there's a lot of problems that you just need a satisfactory answer, not the perfect one, because finding the perfect one would cost so much in terms of time or effort that it's not actually worth getting the perfect answer. Good enough is what we want. And that's how we work, and that's how we want to teach computers to work, too. But we have to give them rules on how to do it, and that's a heuristic. Okay? It says, okay, well, this is how you're going to do it. Like, let's say, real simple example, you have a big tub full of different colored balls, plastic balls, like those kids jump in, right? Imagine that. And you want a purple ball, okay? Well, there's a lot of pearl balls in there. How do you know which one to pick? How do you solve this problem, right? Well, generally what we would do is be like, well, that one's easiest. It's close to the top, and I can reach it, right? And so we just pick kind of the closest one and the easiest one to get to. We're not going to go, oh, let me dig through and get one from the bottom, you know, when I can see all these ones on the top. So it'll be the same kind of thing. That's actually two things we've done is object recognition, okay, balls, color, okay, and then making a decision using a heuristic. Which one? Okay. When it's any purple ball, we just need a purple ball, any, any one's good enough. So we pick the easiest one to get. So that's what we teach computers how to do. I'm sorry, like I said, I have so much stuff to, to say and I haven't gotten near through maybe uh, three quarters of it. Okay, <clears throat> difficult things for AI to do, driving a car, recognizing objects that vary like a chair or a cup, understanding these visual things okay, that we do, 
Okay, uh, sarcasm. <laughs> if we can get a robot or a computer to understand it's sarcasm, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? That would just be a triumph for psychology and computers. <clears throat> and making decisions, no previous data. It's got to infer. It's got to use other similar decisions to do it. So um, one thing that we have uh, that we can think about is simple tasks like having a, a robot get you a sandwich. How does that work? How do we do that, right? Well, hey, robot, get me a sandwich. What's a sandwich? Well, maybe it doesn't know the word sandwich, so it has to look it up. Oh, sandwich is food? Okay, good, food. So I need to go to a food place. It looks for restaurants or stores that have sandwiches. So it looks for food, then sandwich in the list. Oh, now, I, now it will use maps, right? Like we have Google Maps and all that stuff, to find where it's going. Travels to that store. Now that's, that's already a huge task, right? <laughs> right? Just getting there without killing people, running stuff over, being destroyed. Okay, all that good stuff. Go to the store, find the sandwich, Choose a sandwich that the owner would want based on knowledge of the owner. Okay. Oh, they're vegetarian. Oh, okay, well, no meat on that. What's meat? Oh, what's vegetarian mean? Oh, right, it has to know that, understand that. Okay, then it has to buy the sandwich. It's not gonna grab it and walk out of the store. I mean, maybe no one would stop the robot. <laughs> oh my God, we just got robbed by a robot. Hopefully it would actually know to pay for that sandwich, right? And then it's gonna carry it without damaging the It would have to know that a sandwich is fragile. Right? Not all things are fragile. You buy some batteries or whatever and bang those around. But you buy a sandwich, you kind of want it in the original state that it was in, right? When it was made into a sandwich. You don't want a squashed mess. Okay? So, uh, you know, and even just carrying a sandwich upside down, it can, you know, mess it up. And you're like, oh, the sauce dripped all the, you know. Right? You know what I'm saying? All right. So, problems with the sandwich. You have to be able to take it back. And then, of course, travel back to the owner and present them with that sandwich. A lot of things that a robot would be able to have to do to do that, okay? So let's look at another specific task, just because it's fun and awesome. Driving a car, okay? So <clears throat> our ability to drive a car is pretty amazing. Years ago, we, we tried, when we first started uh, developing intelligence to drive a car, it could go about two miles an hour because that was all it was able to decide as quickly as it could. <laughs> to be able to drive, oh my God, it's just like you know, being the first time in a car, ah, oh, there's traffic and distractions, uh, you know, right? So that's kind of what the AI was doing, probably freaking out. Uh, but eventually we've gotten better and faster with these types of decisions. And so driving a car, besides all the easy stuff, okay, lanes, signs, hazards, people, okay, the actual act of driving, knowing what to do in unforeseen circumstances, they also have to predict the future. If you see a car in another lane and it's slowly moving forward, what do you think is going to ha happen in the next few seconds with that car? You know it's going to keep slowly moving forward, right? Probably. <laughs> you don't know for sure, but most likely it's going to keep slowly moving forward. So that's predicting the future. So it has to kind of know, you know, based on what's going to happen also. So let's look at what we've got for driving a car. This is wonderful stuff. Well, this is actually... Um, from AI here, the movie. Now, I wanted to point this out real quick because this actually would be a great environment for a car to, to drive itself in. Now, Will Smith has stitched, stitched, switched to manual here, and the robots are trying to kill him. But you can observe <laughs> that in this, in this driving environment, the lanes are very clearly marked, uniform color, okay, same width. This would be very easy for a robot to drive in. There's continuous lighting, that's the same. So it wouldn't have to deal with changes in that dynamic. Okay? So. But you know, let's say robots aren't trying to kill you. <laughs> let's say you're just trying to have a robot drive your car. Well, the government is offering a $2 million prize for the best. This really puts the auto back into automobile. Computer driven car. 2006 VW Passat and it is moving around this parking lot without a driver. Oh my god! No inside it, and no one is steering it by remote control. Nicknamed Junior, this robot car probes its environment with rotating laser scanners, which paint a 360-degree image of the surroundings 10 times a second. Then Junior decides for himself, using artificial intelligence so software crazy. running on powerful computers, just how best to proceed along the route that has been assigned to it. 
Sebastian Thrun leads the Stanford. <laughs> so basically, uh, we had we've had to do uh, develop a, a, a sensor input system that can sense other cars, objects around there. But the important thing is the thinking, right? It has to think. Now, uh, at some point, actually, when they when they had this car on the course, they present it with a car that's stopped in the course of where it's supposed to do, and 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 uh, Junior has to figure out where to go. And one time, uh, Junior just gets confused and stops and doesn't know what to do. Okay? So uh, they gave it another shot, and then Junior stops for a second and then drives around it. Okay? So it's still a work in progress. We're not at the point where we're going to unleash these things on the highways of the world yet, but we are testing them. Okay? And because obviously, who wants to be killed by a computer-driven car? You know? I mean, <laughs> so... Yeah, right. And imagine the insurance companies and all that kind of stuff. But uh, we are getting there, okay? So this is happening right now. And uh, you know, we, can have, we do have things where you know, computers can assist in driving and keep from having accidents. That's probably what will happen first is that kind of thing, computer-assistant driving. And then uh, finally, full automatic driving, okay? But uh, you know, it's, it's, just, it's a very difficult problem, but it's a great example for artificial intelligence. So, all right, let's go to the big prize, the big pie in the sky, human-like robots, okay? So they, we want them to look like humans, well, at some point. I mean, that's kind of creepy, but yet cool, okay? But at least in the shape of a human being. So uh, they can do things that human beings can do, fingers, toes, eyes, okay, talking. Okay? Would we program them with emotions to make them more real, okay? If we do, we gotta deal with the consequences of that, right? What actions would they take? Would they be allowed to just do anything their little computer brain desires? Okay. Then we actually get into the world of Isaac Asimov and you know, the three laws, if you've uh, read his books or seen the, the iRobot movie. What you know, would they be able to do to protect humanity or harm humanity? Safety issues, right? Maybe the robot doesn't know its own strength. <laughs> oh, you know, just crush something that cost $1,000, right? There goes my Ming vase, right? Stupid computer. And you know what if what if uh, you don't like what's out there on the market and you decide to make your own robot? Well, this guy did because he didn't have a girlfriend, so he decided he would make his own. It's actually a couple guys who did it. This is pretty. This is creepy. I mean, this robot is the most realistic looking. That is a robot right there. <laughs> Now he's running like a little diagnostic of her facial movements and things like that. You know, opening her mouth, smiling, blinking. Yeah, actually, you have a blink every so often to look real. <laughs> and of course, you can talk to it, It'll answer questions and things like that. Japanese guy. Of course, you know, walking around is a little bit of a challenge. You don't really have too many of those yet. But yeah, you know, if you just walked by her somewhere, you'd probably think it was a real person if you didn't look too closely. And we are having stuff like that. Now this guy, this guy did make his own girlfriend. So one of the things this guy did is uh, he actually added sensory input to the, to the body of this robot. He's asking in directions right now. But uh, it can feel the touch on their arm in different places. And he actually asks it to now. let him know when he when it feels pain. So it's simulated pain. I will let you know. I am starting to feel it. Please let go of my arm. You are hurting me. Why did you do that for? It's hurt. Why did now she's gonna rub it? Like, ow, that hurt. I think it would be easier for this guy to use a dating site, but still, he's done something quite I don't extraordinary. want to do this anymore. <laughs> right. All right, so this guy made his own girlfriend. Uh, 
But yeah, so we are getting closer to human-like robots. Um, and I want to show you one of the best ones here, kind of as a, like the last clip I have. I'm going to need some very clever robot files. And apparently... Now this is this Honda's uh, Osimo robot. Uh, it's, it is programmed to be very much like human and learn things, which is really important. You can teach it new objects, new words, okay? And, and that's one of the big parts of artificial intelligence is being able to learn, obviously. Add stuff to your knowledge base. So this guy is going, he's saying stuff I've already said, like computers are really good at specific things, not so good at general things, okay? So let me show you, he goes to visit Asimo. There it is. This Asimo is the smiler, smarter brother of the one I met at Disneyland. It looks at the world through two camera eyes. And it can walk around. We interpret these images as a man waving. There's a big one. Asimo can't interpret anything at all. Professor Koenig may as well be a psychedelic swirl of digital rubbish. <laughs> So, Professor, um, Asimo is just an uncomprehending box of electronics. So, how do you make him look and learn? <laughs> well, uh, we start uh, teaching Asimo to see just the way uh, baby starts to explore the world. Teach it like a so baby. You put an object uh, close to uh, the baby in its reaching distance, the baby immediately attempts to, tries to fixate it or to grasp it. So, uh, going close to his grasping and reaching distance yeah. shows him this is an important object and uh, he should try to attempt to fixate. So he's, so he's, uh, he's locked on So it's like a person, if someone holds up uh, something to you, oh, well, I should uh, this, pay attention. Uh, close distance, in this reaching distance, uh, the robot will try to keep in action because uh, any object which is in this reaching distance all right, so they're going to teach it a couple of objects here. Get to it. Right? They learned. We're going to try my There we go. This, incidentally, is merely because his ears aren't really good enough for the voice stuff over the distance. This is a direct tap into his brain. Anyway, as you know. Toy duck. Yes. Do you hear it? It's a toy duck. It's a toy duck. <laughs> Next, I want Asimo to learn something new. I brought along two objects for him to identify. One like is his grandpa from the 1950s, and the other is a Mini Cooper, the British one. So, he's never seen these before. He's learning these from scratch. So, let's see what he makes of this. Asimo. Make sure it wasn't cheating. I got the new show is a tickle. He does do a chair. Here's Grandpa. Right. Now. Sorry, I didn't mean about that. He's there, yeah. We'll try that out later on. Go back. Oh, this is wrong. There so, Yes, this is correct. Or, no, this is wrong. Yes, this is correct. Okay. That means he's there, yeah. We'll try that out later on. Go back with Grandpa. We'll see if he remembers who he is. Next. The Mini Cooper. As you know. It's one of the most important small cars in history. <laughs> maybe toy car. He says maybe, maybe toy car. Cooper. Mini Cooper. <laughs> okay. Now he goes Mini Cooper. Now let us see if the lad can remember Grandpa. As you know. <laughs> Isn't it cute? And now, it's not a toy car, remember? It's now a Mini Cooper. As you know, Mini Cooper. Precocious little brat, isn't it? <laughs> so, and he even brings up, he has it identify a chair, which is pretty amazing. It's good at identifying chairs. They bring out a uh, regular chair. And then they're like, okay, haha, -ha, here is a stool. <laughs> and it figures out that that's a chair too, which is pretty impressive, considering that has no back on it and it's totally different shape. Then they bring out a table to see if it knows if it's not a chair, and it says, nope, that's not a chair. 
So uh, it's actually, you know, pretty good at, at object recognition, which is one of the big challenges of artificial intelligence. So we've got this thing, ASIMO, recognizing objects, learning, understanding speech, and being able to move around and interact and walk. Okay? So these are all the things we needed, really, to have our robot companion. Okay? So we really do have them um, already, uh, but really expensive. <laughs> so that's kind of the reason that uh, you know, you're not having You saw the one made robot or whatever, right? You know, it probably costs like $2 million to make. Uh, you know, same thing, Osimo probably costs even more. So, you know, if you ask why don't I have my robot companion, well, why doesn't everyone have their own yacht, right? It's kind of the same thing. Right now, the, the technology is, you know, prohibitively expensive, as they say. So, um, we are there in terms of technology in a lot of ways. We've got what we, we need in terms of being able to do the things. However, we're at the stage where we need to run a lot of tests. Okay? So we can do what we need, but we need to test them to make sure they don't kill people or break stuff or, uh, you know, really to let them interact in human society, we have to be very, very careful, uh, of course, because they don't think, uh, even though it's artificial thinking, it's not real thinking, and they still can't match nearly what a human being can do. But just like how computers have been, you know, we started with basically glorified calculators as computers, right? And now my phone is more powerful as a computer than the entire ENIAC computer, which took an entire room, right? The early, early computers that we had. So we are still growing, if not exponentially, we're growing geometrically in terms of the power of, of computer processing and the amount of data we can access. So it's not a question of if, it is a question of when. Okay? We will be able to do this at some point, you know, as long as the human race survives long enough to do that, right? And uh, then we have to worry about the robot uprising later after we build the robots, <laughs> survive that one. So, um, but yes, it is possible. Yes, we can get there. Uh, right now, it's just really, really, really expensive. Okay? But as they said in Bionic Man, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. So we do have the technology. We're testing it right now, and we are going to see it. And I would say that you're going to see more and more robots within the next 10 years, especially coming from Japan, because Japan loves robots. Okay? Uh, if you look at their popular entertainment, you know, their manga, their animation, tons and tons of robots everywhere. They love the idea of human robot companions. So they'll probably be the first to, to make it. Uh, if anybody does, you know, Asimo is, and, and most of those other, you know, human-like robots we saw are coming out of Japan. So, and of course, we do have some things here too, but we, we're more doing things like driving, self-driving car, and, and things like that. So, uh, but they're coming. So, be ready for it, and uh, be ready for the next stage of artificial intelligence. All right. So, thank you for coming. And again, we've got about five minutes for questions, and then we do need, need, need to get out. So any questions for Steven? Yes, yes sir. sir. Uh, how well does something like Moore's Law apply to robotics? Um, that's a good question. I mean, uh, that was kind of what I was saying before. In terms of computing power and brain power, it applies directly. However, because of some of the, the tasks that we try to do that are so unpredictable, uh, like uh, the sense of touch, you know, how can we predict how well that we're going to be able to simulate the sense of touch in the future? You know, picking objects up, moving them, 3D perception. That's the big unknown. So we are growing in terms of the, the if you just look at artificial intelligence as, say, an expert system like Watson, then Moore's law directly applies to that. But as soon as you bring in physical activity, doing things, then it doesn't because it's a completely different realm. Yeah. Other questions? Do you want to explain what Moore's Law is? Yeah, you know, that's a good, I was just about to do that too, so. <laughs> well, yeah, basically Moore, Moore's Law uh, that every, how many years is it? Well, like usually 18 months. Every 18 months, okay. Every 18 months of the computing power doubles, basically, uh, you know, of what we could do 18 months ago. So, uh, so he was asking if that applied. And, and it, you know, it applies in terms of, you know, as I said, just kind of informational systems that do intelligence because they run straight on the computer. But as terms of, in terms of other physical activity, performing tasks and things like that, that's such a nebul nebulous uh, type of question. 
and problem that we can't really quantify it as much as we like, which is one of the big problems of artificial intelligence is how do we do this stuff? How do we as human beings recognize objects and walk and talk and pick things up? And, and we have to think about this stuff and, and it's hard to quantify because a lot of stuff we do is very vague and fuzzy and uh, we can't quantify it. So that's why that part of the whole AI is outside of uh, Moore's law realm. Yes? The presentation is more on robots as a companion and, and it's very expensive to do that as a companion, but right. development of robots for machinery and oh, assembly yeah. and that kind of stuff is well past the infancy, and, and we're replacing people at GM putting cars together. Yes. So the cost is not a problem there because there's a profit motive. Right. Uh, in, in society, I think that's where all the development, the majority of the development is, mm -hmm. is going to be. And maybe in Japan, we'll see the the, the house robot or something. But the right. point was the emphasis on robots now is, is to replace humans in the workforce to arbitrage and make money, right? Well, that's kind of an interesting uh, perspective on it, or interesting way to look at it, is these type of robots, in a lot of ways, that perform these tasks, aren't that smart. They really just do one thing over and over again, like drill in a bolt or, or pick up a thing. And you know, there are some that do a little more complicated tasks, but they're not really good examples of artificial intelligence because they don't think a whole lot. And they're limited to a very small physical space. They might go over here, pick something up, go over here and put something down or you know, something like that. So they don't have to really be that smart. So we've kind of already gotten to the point where we don't need to make those guys any smarter. We've made them, we, we're smart enough to build assembly line robots and manufacturing robots and all kinds of stuff like Warehouse, that. Warehouse, distribution centers, all of those things. Right, yeah, and they don't, they're not really that smart, which is the reason I didn't really bring them up too much, because they're kind of like, I don't know, a dog smart or something, you know, but not, not as smart as, uh, and like I said, there's so much to talk about though. So, that, I mean, that is a whole aspect of society. And, but remember I mentioned that we do like to have uh, computers and robots do these mundane basic tasks that we hate, you know, like cleaning and stuff like that. And assembly line stuff is something that is really redundant and annoying and, and prone to, for humans to make mistakes because we get bored. All right, and guess what? Robots don't get bored unless we program them to get bored, which would generally be a bad thing. But, uh, you know, so they don't. So they can just keep drilling all day or whatever, you know, until their servos or hydraulics break. Yeah. Any other questions? I know this kind of like Andy's. Okay. Um, you know, my, my analogy in my mind is like, okay, at some point we got rid of the analog vinyl records, or mostly got rid of them, and we went to these digital CDs for music, okay? And it's getting finer and finer and finer, more and more refined, but you know, some purists say, you know, of course it'll never be as information rich as something analog like a vinyl disc. Uh huh. Well, that's, that's already not true. true. Well, at some point, it's, you said people are going to say it's good enough. It's yeah. not that. I see it's got enough yeah. detail that no one's going to notice the difference that it's not really analog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that really what's going on here with robot companions? I mean, if, if the computing power is, is a thousand times better than it is today, or a million times better, or whatever, is it going to reach a point where we're going to say good enough? It, it's still never, it's never actually thinking in, the, in any sort of human sense, but it's good enough, or is it actually we're going to say that when computing power is a million times better than now, it really is thinking in the same sense that we are thinking with our neurons and all that? I think that what you're talking about is something I've thought about in terms of uh, sort of black box uh, mentality. If you've, if you've done engineering, uh, you, you have a black box, and you send it certain inputs, and it gives you certain outputs. And if we make a black box, uh, artificial intelligence, that if we ask it the same things as a human, and it basically gives the same exact type of answers as a human being, do we care how it does it inside the box? Because theoretically, it is thinking, right? We don't, it may not be doing it in the same way as human beings do. But for all intents and purposes, when it gives us that output, it's just like a person, right? If it, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, right? It's a duck. So it may, it, it, whether it thinks or not, is almost like a, a theological or spiritual or <laughs> psychological question, and we may not know the answer to that. But I think in terms of a scientific answer, as long as it behaves externally as a human being, we can't distinguish it. And there's you know, so many things. Again, Turing test is something. We, you, know, you, you, you have a computer that is answering questions, and if you can't tell the difference between the human's answers and the computer answers, it passes the test. So if we have a, a, a robot that can pass that test, that it's indistinguishable from a human's uh, reactions and characteristics. It doesn't really matter if it's thinking or not, maybe uh, you know, spiritually or psychologically, but engineering, scientific-wise, no, it doesn't matter. It's, it's thinking. OK, folks, I think we need to quick get out of here. All right. Thank you for your time.
Thank you. That was a lot of fun, Mike.